A long time ago, there was nothing. That's kind of boring, so let's skip ahead to where there was something. Oh, hey, look, it's something. Actually, it's not just any random something, it's the Stylar Empire. What's that, you're probably asking, pulling out your Invader Zim Wikipedia page to check what episode this is from, but don't worry about it. Almost all of this is for the sake of writing needlessly elaborate fanfiction, so we can get a bit crazy here, especially with some weird alien race no one has ever heard of. So what's their deal? Well, aside from being a bunch of very weird-looking people with four arms and, like, five eyes, the Stylars were a bunch of really smart aliens who lived on a space station they built around a star. They were trying to make labor faster and build more ships, so they took the most reasonable course of action. They began owning up to their responsibilities and working harder to- Nah, just kidding, they created life instead. Creating your own civilization of slaves is kind of a new take on Frankenstein's monster, but okay, whatever. Stylars are obviously way too cool for any of this manual labor, so they began using some less cool aliens they made with science to do the jobs for them. The best alien they created wound up being this one guy named Void, who they started cloning a few years after he entered adulthood. Keep your eye on this one, folks, because he's about to be the reason Zim eventually exists. They couldn't call all of this guy's clones Void because that was his name, so they just started using the whole group as if it were a species. If you couldn't connect the dots, this is the start of the Urken race. But Void thought Stylars kind of sucked, so he grabbed all of the Urken test tube babies and got out of Dodge before the Stylars could stop him. He spent a while just kind of drifting around aimlessly in space with these seven babies until he found a small planet he could inhabit as his own. This is the very beginning of what would eventually become the Urken Empire, but it's really boring and nothing happens for a while, so let's skip ahead a few decades. Moving on to ancient Urk, the growing empire is currently ruled by seven tallists. Keegan, Amber, Spork, Slate, Apollo, Miyuki, and Zu. These seven were ruling the empire in sectors under the supervision of Void, who's starting to get weirdly sick for some reason. Don't worry about it, he totally won't die. Most of the tallest's defining character trait is being an asshole, so considering the fact that Apollo was not an asshole, they didn't like him very much. Miyuki liked him though, something that definitely didn't make Zoo really jealous. Unfortunately, everybody also hated Zoo after he got most of his body screwed up in some freak accident. Having one of your rulers mostly made of metal looked really stupid, so they kicked him out of their cool kids table, leaving Zoo alone and miserable. That definitely won't come back to bite them later. Meanwhile, Tallest Keegan is obsessed with their empire having a really big military, so he assigns Commander Luck to train two younger Urken soldiers he sees potential in. These two were named Mux and Wes, and they'd go on to train his brothers under Luck for the next century. But army shit isn't the only thing Urk has, because we also got science shit, courtesy of Miyuki wanting some of her people to not be completely stupid. Two of the scientists were a pair of twins, Dan and Pyro, who were slowly starting to sneak around under the radar to do some super unethical experiments and stuff. All this science attracted the attention of Vort, a much bigger planet that offered to help get Urk on its feet in exchange for an alliance. Void sees this as a win because Vortians have one thing that Urkins don't, and that would be a lot of money. Tallest Miyuki teamed up with the Queen of Vort after the alliance was made, establishing nine research stations where they could collaborate on great scientific ventures. Another group of aliens called Screwheads saw the cool alliance stuff happening and tried to get in on it, but the Urkins just enslaved their people instead. This made the Screwheads very angry, especially this one guy named Bolt. That definitely won't come back to bite them later. What about the army? Oh, right. Tallest Keegan is pretty impressed when Commander Luck brings over Mux and Wes for a friendly family dinner, informing him that both soldiers have graduated training and are ready for promotions. But Mux got an A on their last exam, while Wes only got a B, so Tallest Keegan decided to kill Wes by shooting him at point blank right in front of Mux. Rather than give the poor guy time to cope with the traumatic experience, Keegan continues brainwashing Mux with training and shoves o over a captain named Zill to become his assistant. Again, that definitely won't come back to bite them later. Tallest Miyuki sees Keegan taking all these soldiers and captains under his wing and decides that she wants a student of her own, picking the smallest and weirdest looking kid she can find in the Empire. This is Quo, someone who will later grow up to become Miyuki's heir. Meanwhile, Void is pissed because their securities have been breached by a lone Stylar. He doesn't know how one of them got all the way to Urk, which is very far out from the Stylar Empire itself, but he sends out the other Tallists into a frenzy to figure this out. Amber and Spork are too stupid to do anything, Miyuki is busy with science, Keegan is rampaging around with his ar army to search all of Urk, Apollo is too much of a pansy to hunt anyone down, and Zoo is currently hiding in the vents to avoid people seeing him. But Slate isn't incompetent or annoying, despite always being sad, so he discovers the broken part of their shields that the Sky Stylar entered through. The only evidence they found was a boring journal, so they eventually gave up on searching for the Stylar, who may or may not be still hiding in the Empire now. 
On an unrelated note, back with Miyuki's student, Quo meets a poet named Sterling, someone who he'd spend hours on end studying with at Irk's library. The Irkin Empire moves from their planet to a large fleet of ships after this, now spending most of the time traveling the galaxy rather than staying stuck in one place. While that happens, Dan and Pyro go back to doing evil science crap in the lower levels of the ship, rooms and hallways that were kind of forgotten about and abandoned in later years. The twins managed to create life on their own, but didn't get it quite right. You see, Void kind of cheated when creating Irk because he stole the Stylar's blueprints and gear to create more clones of himself. Dan and Pyro didn't have that material, so they were just winging it, and the Urkin they created wound up being very deformed. This abomination later became known as Hickory, someone they ejected from Urk and sent away to a random smaller planet with tropical forests and villages. Speaking of other random stuff, the Inquisitorians are doing great, by the way. They're just kind of traveling around on their own ship to collect knowledge and data. One of the Inquisitorians is getting really bored of this, though, so she decides to study abroad by ditching the ship for a more fun planet instead. This just so happens to be the same world that Hickory now lives on. This chick's name is Mercedes, and she's going to be important later. Now, what about politics? How are politics in space? Not great, in case you were wondering. Zoo is starting to get really angry with Apollo for falling in love with Miyuki, constantly giving her art and gifts to distract her from science and other work in the Empire. Zoo kind of wants Miyuki to rise to power as Urk's sole leader someday, though, because she's the only one smart enough to hang out with him, so he wants Apollo out of the picture yesterday time. But Miyuki really likes Apollo, and we'd be sad if he died, so Zu just turns Apollo to stone and calls it a day. Even though this is arguably better than death itself, Miyuki is still understandably bummed out about it, so Zu decides to cheer her up by starting to violently murder all of the other tallists. At last, we finally see Zim himself enter our story. Zimzam the Spaceman was assigned to Vort Research Station 9 to help work on developing some sort of new weaponry, given how problematic and destructive he'd been on the battlefield. But this doesn't help a lot because Zim winds up creating Cthulhu, no, not that one, and it's a horrible blob creature that absorbs any and all energy in the area, thus including the energy of living people. Miyuki is eaten by Zim's monster when visiting the station later, thus being murdered by the poorly planned creation. Cthulhu escapes after this, but that's probably not a problem that will come back later. Quo, despite being Miyuki's student, doesn't know who was responsible for her murder and begins to panic. Zoo is also getting pretty nervous, considering the fact that Miyuki being in charge was his key ticket to running the Empire from her shadow. With her gone, Zoo realizes he's made a very big mistake by choosing to kill Tallest Spork last because he's still alive right now. Fun! Just to make Zoo's existence worse, Spork then selects two soldiers at random to join him as Tallest. He ignores their actual names and gives them titles based on their eye color. But they aren't actually tall enough to be in charge because all of the other real tallists are dead, and the cloning machine broke a while ago, so it's only making short people, which means that Spork has to get creative. He makes the random duo metal suits to hide how short they are, and this works. Now we got red and purple in the mix, so nothing bad should ever happen again. Spoiler alert, oh shit, something bad happened. Cthulhu came back to the Empire to steal his collar from Zim, eating and killing tallest Spork in the process. Cthulhu seems to have gained some sort of macrovay form of sentience after retrieving his collar, though, so he runs away to go brood and try to make himself look less like a monster. That definitely won't come back to bite them later, especially not in song form. This leaves Red and Purple as the sole rulers of Urk, and with everyone else dead, they're the highest authority. This isn't good because they both have close to no training whatsoever, leading the entire empire conquering a dangerous amount of planets and now spreading across the galaxy at a rate faster than it ever had before. This is clearly bad news, so Quo and Sterling run away to avoid the mess, leaving Zoo before he could try to bring Quo to power as tallest Miyuki's proper successor. Commander Luck also leaves the Empire, but he has to go track down that Cthulhu guy and hopefully kill him. Red and Purple let him leave, but after assuming he died in battle, promoted Mux to be their right-hand man and commander. This is the first time that any Urken has military authority over the Empire without being one of the tallest themselves, and it goes downhill pretty fast. Turns out killing someone's brother and giving them loads of trauma for their entire brainwashed youth turns them into a really shitty person that shoots people he doesn't like. Who knew? Red and Purple don't really care about forming any alliances or bettering the Empire, they just want to fly in a straight line and shoot planets with their new giant gun. But by invading and destroying a lot of planets, they're making a lot of enemies, some of which are residents of the Empire and its allies. One of the allies that stays is the Queen of Vort, who has been around since Ancient Urk without getting murdered, so she knows her shit. The Queen tells the Tallest to, to continue asserting their power by invading the galaxy, hoping to get more cool gifts and perks out of the conquered planets. 
This upsets her lead councilman, Lardnar, who abandons Vort to start a resistance against the Urken Empire, which was later creatively named the Resisti. If we can take anything from Invader Zim, it's definitely the show's fo fantastic naming structure. Three-letter character names and gibberish nonsense. Truly, this show was made with the language of the gods. You know who else is God? Nobody really, but Zoo is probably the next best thing because he's the only survivor from Ancient Urk, which technically means that he should be tallest. But nobody wants to listen to a scary monster that lives in the vents of their spaceship, so he decides to invade a smaller tropical planet to blow off some steam. But before we talk about that plan, let's talk about the actual resistance. You see, Lardnar wasn't actually the first person to go against the Urken Empire, so let's make sure we mention this guy named Andy. No one knows where he came from exactly, because his home planet was destroyed by Urk a long time ago, but he's a hybrid of a Stylar and a Shadow Walker genes. This is a very dangerous combination. The Stylars are the strongest and most magically inclined species in the whole galaxy, yet despite their immense power, because of their size they aren't very fast, making it easier for enemies to escape or dodge their stronger attacks. However, Shadow Walkers are the one of the most agile and secretive species in the galaxy, able to move faster than the speed of light itself due to the fact that they're literally made of darkness. If you couldn't guess, combining these two aliens just created the deadly assassin in the entire cosmos. So when Andy founded the Urken Rebellion, drastic measures had to be taken to ensure that he couldn't just wipe out the entire empire on his own. Urk has a lot of protocols and security just to keep Andy from stepping foot on their ships and planets, especially those where the tallest reside, because if he gets anywhere near Urk itself, the war is over in seconds. Andy has slaughtered an entire armadas of Urkens on his own, and he's starting to slow down because of his old age in recent years. I mean, hey, when Stylars only live to be 600 and Shadow Walkers 400, it's a bit hard to keep yourself at the top of your game as you reach age 1000. We won't see much of Andy until later on, so let's leave it here until now. Okay, back to the Empire's plans that I mentioned. During the invasion, Captain Zill is left behind, but this could be very bad news for Dan and Pyro's extremely unethical science. They've been doing it in secret in the lower levels of the Massive, aka Urk's big ship that leads most invasions, for over a hundred years at this point. And that's because while the ship is always moving, the cleaning crew is too busy with the engine and crew maintenance to come down to the empty storage basements. If the ship stops, the cleaning crew would have time to come down below deck and find all the bad science shit that the twins have been busy with, something they'd probably go to jail for. Dan thinks that prison is for bitches, so when Commander Mux asks him about the planet, he insists there were no survivors and they move on without Zill. Meanwhile, Zill meets Mercedes and Hickory down on the planet he'd been left on, slowly forming a close bond with the two of them over time. On the subject of bad science, one of the twins' latest not-so-great experiments is TLWP, which is short for the Living Weapons Project. Their goal was to make a sentient being capable of being Urk's greatest weapon in combat or invasions, so basically some sort of super soldier. But before they could get any live test subjects, they built an android to test their theories on. The android's name was Rio, someone who loved talking to Taz and listening to music on her radio. Rio had dreams of being a famous singer surrounded by bright lights and glamour, a dream that would probably won't be horribly crushed by any ironic future events. Oh, by the way, Taz is a janitor on Urk. She's only allowed to be the one cleaning the twins' lab because she's defective and nobody would listen to her claims anyways, so it's safe for her to help m maintain the lower levels. She's defective because she's freakishly tall, but that's because one of the cloning machines was able to regenerate an old piece of DNA from ancient Urk and create an eighth true tallest. This means that Taz should be in charge, along with her equally tall sister, but Red and Purple chased her sister out of the Empire for treason and demoted Taz as a defect instead. How's Urk doing? It's doing pretty good. Urk is invading a lot of planets, and it always wins. Until it doesn't. Their first failed invasion was on this tiny and unsuspecting planet, yet it was also one with a lot of very big guns. The Empire's ships leave the planet after failing the invasion, but they left another Urken behind. Zill and Mercedes are growing closer on the tropical planet they'd been living on. The unlikely pair have fallen in love, something that Hickory makes fun of them for at least six times a day. Unfortunately, the Urken Empire has to re-establish how much of a badass they are after that failed invasion, so they decide to target the nearest planet, which just so happens to be the small tropical one our trio landed on ages ago. They attack the planet again, this time destroying everything rather than trying to take it over. Zill was taken prisoner when he was recognized as Urken, torn away from Hickory and Mercedes. Once Urk looked cool again, they collectively shrugged and left the destroyed planet behind. Zill is brought to Dan to take prisoner, but Dan decides to continue being the worst character by bringing him down to the laboratory instead. Pyro gets upset when he sees his brother holding Zill hostage for experiments, so Dan decides to subject his brother to the electric chair until his brain is fried. Once Pyro is speaking gibberish as if it's a new foreign language, Dan throws Pyro into the dungeons in Zill's place. 
Stan then proceeded to do a bunch of evil, no-good science shit to Ryo and Zill in his empty laboratory. The two prisoners managed to form a strong bond, even if they were both being tortured by all the training sessions they were put through. But the longer they were forced to fight each other, the weaker their strained friendship became, eventually leading to the two lab rats hating each other. In one of their more brutal fights, Zill went blind in one eye and half of his face was horribly scarred, and Ryo obtained a new severe speech impairment with his voice box damaged. Despite how much the two hated each other, when they got the word that Dan was kidnapping a Smeet to experiment on, they both agreed he'd cross the line. The unlikely duo began to plan their escape with Taz, who had found a pair of defective twins to take care of around this time. Ryo and Taz agreed to take the twins in and teach them together, but Zill just wanted to go find his own friends. Despite this agreement, Ryo and Taz are not dating, they're just friends. You know who is dating, though? Sterling and Quo, who are currently falling in love as they travel the galaxy together as runaways. Back to the Resistance, Kai has officially established himself as a rebel. He met a group of rebels under Andy's command, including Shadowstride, Carlos, Moxie, and a few others. As their ranks grew in number, the Resisti was destroyed elsewhere in the galaxy and flung off into space. Larnar was forced to attempt a more peaceful approach after losing his legs in the Resisti's destruction so he opened up Traveling Theater's space station. Once his legs were replaced with mechanical ones, he began recruiting other fallen rebels to help him run the theater, which was secretly a base to help rebels and free other planets. But it's okay, don't worry about it. Weather update, things are going crazy everywhere. Now the Vorshan Queen has a kid, who refuses to cooperate with their mom for three key reasons. One, she's a bitch. Two, Vord is kind of turning evil by helping dis Urk destroy half the galaxy. And three, Emmy's mom isn't exactly supportive of their life choices and kicked Emmy out of the house. That's a bummer. On the topic of other civilizations turning evil to side with Urk, the Inquisitorians don't want to risk having their own ship or planet destroyed, so they try to form an alliance with the Empire. This plan works out great because Commander Mux is actually the one running the Empire at this point, considering he does a lot more than the Tallists do nowadays. The Sirens are also trying to weasel their way into an alliance around the same time. No, not those Sirens, the alien ones. They're pretty elves with magic rocks. Without these magic rocks, they can't use their magic to hypnotize people, leaving them as boring aliens with pointy ears. Other aliens can also become sirens by stealing one of these magic rocks, but that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Guess who doesn't want an alliance with Urk? The Moon People, aka a group of lunar aliens who have two partnered kingdoms on the moon orbiting Earth. Thankfully, Earth is very far off the map from Urk, who doesn't even think that the planet actually exists anymore, so the Moon Kingdoms are safe from being invaded. They don't face any Urk in contact until two rebels named Keech and Lorana outside their kingdom's border. These two also hate the Empire, so they're cool and the royals, brother and sister, Lord Orion and Empress Luna, decide to let them stay on the moon. By the way, screwheads are still slaves to Urk. In fact, the Empire destroyed their planet when people tried to rebel for their own freedom, which resulted in Tallest Keegan putting their king's head on a stick and killing almost everyone else. But that was decades ago. Now the few surviving screwheads still alive are captives who work in Ant Empire Factories. Bolt is one of these surviving screwheads and he's very unhappy, especially since his father was the king and his little sister named Torx died in the past genocides too. Bolt eventually manages to escape Urk, but he does return later in disguise to attend the first Vorshan Gala to be held in centuries. The Gala is held as a peacemaking ceremony between Urk and Vort, along with other allies to the two growing empires. At this event, Commander Mux and General Decilio get to meet up for another date at the time. Mux is the Urkin ambassador for the event, while Decilio came on behalf of the Sirens. They bicker a lot at first, but slowly begin to get along more, eventually falling in love later on and having a secret wedding unknown to their superiors. Meanwhile, Dan has already began experimenting on the kidnapped Smeet he stole for about two years. Zill and Rio finally gain enough resources and strength to overthrow Dan and attack him, destroying the lab and freeing the Smeet. Rio takes the Smeet out of the laboratories before they can discover what his powers may be. You see, every victim of Dan's experiments leaves them with a strange and unnatural ability that other Urkins don't possess. Rio is able to absorb and control electricity, even blasting out powerful electric surges to attack opponents. Zill's body lost form and thus allows him to shapeshift, but this is not an ability he wants to use unless threatening a new opponent. No, for personal reasons, Zill prefers to use his own face. The group was clueless to what strange powers the Smeet had, so Rio left the little Urkin with the Tallists, hoping they'd have enough power to undo any of the damage that Dan had caused and knowing they weren't strong enough to cure the little one on their own. During this exchange, Dan escapes Zill's attacks and continues to lurk in the shadows of the Urkin Empire. After the group agrees on their choices, after the group agrees on their choices, Zill flees Urk on a small escape ship to go find Mux, hoping to get revenge on the one who left him to die in the first place. 
Rio went away with Taz and the twins to join the rebellion, silently hoping that the tallists will use their power to cure the Smeet. Rio has never met the tallists before, but he's heard they're very powerful from Dan and Taz, so he's unfortunately unaware of the fact that Red and Purple are idiots. This is painfully evident when the tallists don't even recognize the Smeet has been mutated and give him to Mux as a new apprentice, considering the commander hasn't been able to find a student on his own. His husband Decilio names the Smeet sick after an ancient siren gem from his homeworld. Back with Rio's team, they actually join the rebellion very quietly, pun not intended. Even though Rio has used electronic powers to destroy an entire fleet of Verkan ships, their existence is still nothing more than a rumor. It isn't until Rio and Kai encounter each other on a supply ship they both plan to raid, fighting until they realize they're on the same side of the war, that Rio's group really gets involved with the rebel fighting. After Rio and Kai make amends, they actually form one of the strongest friendships within the rebel ranks, making them a very successful team for stealth missions. The Rebellion even received some additional help from Lardnar, who's discovered how to create interdimensional portals with his theater space station to help those in need across every timeline. Dan, once again being the worst character in this fanfiction, sees these portals in action and is desperate to recreate them for himself and the Empire, yet he doesn't have the skills that Lardnar possesses and accidentally creates a dangerous vortex, one that will explode and take down the entire massive if it isn't stabilized by transporting matter to another location quickly. Decilio and Mux are still the highest-ranking officials in the Empire Alliances, so Decilio forces Mux to stay behind and sacrifices himself to stop the device from exploding. Commander Mux spends countless weeks searching the whole galaxy for his husband, but is unable to find any sign of him and returns to the Empire to raise sick as his own. Bolt is still a character, though, so he takes Decilio's lost gemstone for himself after it's left behind by the Siren's transport. He doesn't know what to do with it yet, so he just begins taking vengeance on other aliens who've enslaved him across all of Earth's planets and factories. Bolt refuses to join the Rebellion and currently works alone, but his mischief is still doing the Empire a lot of harm. But Bolt is miserable from a life of slavery and torment, so he wants to regain the power he's lost. He wants to be able to control something big to make up for all the years he couldn't control his own life, especially if control can bring pain to those who wronged him. That's definitely not a bad sign for the future. But after Decilio vanished, he didn't die like Mux believed, and was instead teleported onto a dark ship across the galaxy. This is a ship run by Mercedes and Hickory, who aren't very happy to find an Urkin ally in their new home after the Empire took Zill and destroyed their planet. They take Decilio as their prisoner, leaving him to rot in the dungeons as they continue his search for any signs of Zill or his survival. As we know, Zill did survive, but he left the Empire a while ago. Dan really never got over the fact that his three greatest experiments all escaped, especially since Sick was within his grasp now that he lives in the Empire's upper levels. But if Dan ever tried to lay his bloody hands on Sick, Commander Mux would kill him on sight, so he had to come up with another plan. Zill had escaped before Dan could complete his experiments on the Urken, thus being the only reason for part of his body turning blue with the poison in his veins. Dan decided to get a new test subject, someone who wouldn't be able to run away this time, and complete the work he never finished with Zill. This poor guy he kidnaps was a soldier named Good, who develops a strange Jekyll and Hyde situation when the experiments are complete. He wants to run away with the Rebellion, but Dan has a shock collar on his pack that keeps him in the Empire like a very sad dog stuck on a leash. Dan watches the guard from the shadows, something that catches Zoo's attentions and interests. Elsewhere in the Empire, Zim is still around, but he isn't having a great time. Everyone constantly mocks his efforts to achieve greatness, but Zim is determined to prove them wrong by showing them he's capable of invading a planet on his own without the Empire. While he's searching for a planet to conquer, Zim runs into a sleazy Vorshan con artist named Jax, who claims he can help Zim show the galaxy how incredible he is. Zim is immediately swept off his feet and travels with Jax to all sorts of planets to prove his worth. But each invasion attempt fails. Eventually, two other aliens join their ragtag team, a siren named Lon and a screwhead named Blue. Jax is annoyed by the two newcomers, but when he sees that they only add to Zim's chaos on missions, he enjoys the company. Jax never really cared about Zim's plans, and if he did care about Zim, he'd never admit that out loud, because he was more focused on following his own schemes. For every planet they'd visit, Jax used Zim's antics as a distraction while he stole countless riches and valuables from all the kingdoms they visited. Eventually, Zim catches Jax in the act, heartbroken that his first friend was a liar, and goes back to the Empire without saying goodbye to the team. Jax does feel guilty about this fallout, especially since Zim and Jax had begun to form a close connection on recent missions, but the criminal brushed his feelings aside and continued anyway. Next, we finally get a moment of peace for a few years. No, just kidding. The rebels are hatching a plan to steal abortion information at an Alliance event. Rio tries to build an Inquisitorian robot to blend in with the visiting crowds, but he can't get the mechanics right. 
This is around the time that Quo and Sterling began tagging along with Kai's group in the rebellion. They only want to avenge tallest Miyuki's death, not fight at the Empire. They also don't know about Zim being a killer. Ironically enough, even if these two weren't rebels, the Vorshin Queen's kid definitely was. That's about when Shadowstride brought said kid, Emmy, into the rebellion to help Rio build the Inquisitorian robot to spy on the Alliance meetings. They soon finish the robot and name him Norman before immediately being caught by Urkin soldiers, forcing Emmy to send Norman away into space on an escape pod before their base is attacked. Norman eventually lands on an unstable metal planet, where he's left alone for a while and as the planet continues to destroy itself like a ticking time bomb. That is the very same planet that the Empire wants to invade resources for because, of course, that's a great plan, and now it's been a few years, so Sick is about ten years old. Yes, we're still going by Earth years to measure time. It's just a lot easier to, to determine character ages. Deal with it. Sick is still Mux's son and assistant, slowly melting as hard as time continues to pass. Zim has done the polar opposite and done nothing but get on the commander's nerves until he's sent to invade Earth, a planet that the Empire still doesn't believe actually exists. This mission was fake and the tallest had hoped to kill Zim, but he miraculously survives and begins fighting against a human boy named Dib for control of the Earth. The tallest eventually get tired of Zim's antics and call him back to Urk for a trial, but he also survives that and returns to his fake mission on Earth. Mux had been present on Vort Research Station 9 on the day that Zim killed Tallest Miyuki, so he isn't very happy about the trial's failure. Sick just didn't understand the trial and hardly paid any attention to it. Now that Urk has given up on Zim, they return their focus to the metal planet that they want to strip of resources. Sick does some research and discovers that the planet is very unstable, trying to warn Mux that it's likely to explode soon, but the commander doesn't listen and insists they go through with the mission anyway. This results in Mux watching the planet combust while Sick was still on it, so he begs the Tallest to go back for the injured Smeet. Red and Purple don't really care about Sick, and they say they can get Mux a new assistant, so Mux becomes overwhelmed with rage and leaves the Empire in a stolen boot. He finds Sick on the destroyed planet, horrified to find that his son has lost an eye and an arm in the explosion, but they also meet Norman before leaving the planet. As this unlikely family flies around with their voot, Zim is still trying to take over the Earth and fighting Dib. This is two years ago from the present day, so it's also the time period where the Invader Zim TV show takes place, along with the trial mentioned earlier. An ex-invader named Tack was briefly involved with these affairs before being thrown off into space, allowing Lardnar to rescue her and welcome her to the theater. This time period doesn't include the movie, however, because the movie's events aren't canon in this timeline. Rainbot loved the movie, but just couldn't ha handle how stupid the professor was, so they didn't include it for storytelling reasons. What did still happen were the Invader Zim comics. Keep an eye on Zib and Zim number two, because they'll both be important later. Also, this timeline is only focused on the Urkin Empire, the Rebellion, and alien characters involved with both. The Membrane family and Zib stories will not be recapped in this video, but that doesn't matter because they aren't important. You can refresh your memory on Zib's backstory by reading the Zim Void arc of the official comic series. As for the Membrane family, that's a story that we have to save for a later episode of Rick and Outcast, so you'll have to wait and see when Professor plans on telling that tale. This is also around the time that the other timelines began getting involved, if you couldn't guess from the mention of Zib and the Zim Void. Two portals from alternate dimensions open up, one for Pilot and one for Mako, both of which are characters that you'll learn more about in Rick and Outcast itself because their backstories are in a different timeline. Mako meets with Bolt, and they both head towards Earth's moon to try to take over the Lunar Kingdoms. Pilot meets Lardar and starts going on missions across different dimensions after joining the theater troupe, allowing him to find Chami on a scouting mission and bring her back to the theater as well. Chami is a very strong gal because she spent the last year living with rock giants, but if you want to know her story, you will once again have to look into the comics to read about it. About two years later, after Six scars heal and they get him a metal arm, the family spends some time exploring the galaxy until Sick is 12 years old and Mux is 221. The group eventually discovers Earth, a planet far out from the Empire's range and map, so they land here to take shelter and hopefully start a new life together. Mux also knows that Zim was sent here, so they're definitely safe from the Empire's wrath on Earth. This is because the tallest hate Zim and want him away with a 10-foot foot pole, so they're avoiding his planet at all costs. Zill detects Mux's ship finally landing somewhere and decides to follow that signal to Earth still hell-bent on taking revenge on the commander. Dib has been fighting with Zim for the fate of the Earth for over two years now, but he gets even more alarmed when he discovers that their new neighbors are more aliens that may have come to help Zim. Dib meets Sick, and the rest is history, so feel free to start watching Urk and Outcasts at this point and continue the story. It's available on Rainbot's YouTube channel. This was hell to record. It was too long. Why did I write this script so long? Ugh, bye-bye now.